Hello everyone, I'm Lenny Pinna, and I'm the editor of this book, A Face from Uranus, Correspondence Between Ted Burr and Henry Bellman, 1943 to 1945. I'm also the screenwriter for the limited TV series in the name of Jamie Wakefield, Too Pretty for a Boy. Uh, I've been reading episode two. We are now at part three of episode two, Hidden in Bellevue. If you'll remember, um, the first Part of uh, part two was really about Ted's early life, where he very much lived sort of the life of, of a girl at play. And the last scene, he is riding a bicycle where he is a paper boy, and he is uh, delivering papers where he stops in front of this abandoned mansion, and he imagines uh, a scene of a very haughty, pretentious family inside. And this, be this is the beginning uh, germ for the novel he eventually writes, uh, in The Surf and Terror Fled. So this picks up right after that, and we're now moving into high school years, both for Ted and in Henry's flashbacks. Cut to the exterior of Bellevue, Ohio, an ice skating rink, wintertime, day. Fifteen-year-old Ted watches an older high school boy, James Rogers, skating on the pond. He has a crush on James. A few others are also skating. Ted gradually takes to the ice and nervously begins to skate near the perimeter. He is constantly on the lookout for James. James skates by without looking at Ted and performs a few fancier moves and spins. He then turns his body to skate backwards. He skates backwards around the rink more slowly so that as he passes Ted, he is facing Ted's direction. James notices Ted is looking at him. He politely smiles. Ted is paralyzed with his seemingly exposed interest. James observes Ted's awkward expression and behavior and probably senses the reason for it. Quite possibly, James feels some sort of exposure as well for liking the attention. He turns to skate forward to avoid his own embarrassment. We cut to Henry Bellman's study, daytime. He's been reading Ted's letter, and he looks up. You can see that he's feeling some discomfort, and he stares out the window. We dissolve to a flashback. The exterior of Fulton High School, Fulton, Missouri, 1898, during the evening. High school age Henry and Albert are walking around the environs of Fulton High School. They stop and sit on a bench and muse about the future. Henry, where do you think you'll go to college? Albert, my parents want me to go to the University of Mississippi. I hear that's quite a large school and, and very expensive. My father wants me to follow him into the banking business, but that's not what I want. I, I want to study poetry and creative writing. I'd be perfectly happy staying here and going to Aberdeen. I'm sure that's where my grandmother wants me to go, to stay at home and save money, but she's very happy that I want to study music. It's what she's always hoped for me. You're lucky. She believes in your talent. My family doesn't consider writing poetry any great talent. But you're lucky. Your family can afford to send you to such a prestigious university. Too bad we couldn't trade families. I wouldn't trade my grandmother for any amount of money. I'll miss you terribly when I leave. I'll miss you too. Will you promise to write me letters? Yes, of course. If you promise to write me, I promise. I'll write you poems. You know how much I like your poems. You know how much I like you. Henry and Albert hold each other's eyes. Albert slowly moves his face toward Henry's and gently kisses his mouth. Henry closes his eyes, stiffly accepting the kiss. Albert's eyes are open. He gently retreats with a slight smile as Henry keeps his eyes closed an extra moment. He's disoriented. We dissolve back to Henry's study. The elder Henry is still facing out the window, but his eyes are closed, lingering in the memory. 
He slowly turns his face forward, opens his eyes, and looks back at the letter to read. We cut to the interior of the Burr home kitchen during the day. It's lunchtime. Helen Burr, with apron and kitchen spoon in hand, is expecting the children home for lunch. There's a knock at the door. It's Ted's friend, Jean. Hello, Jean. Where's Teddy? Gee, Mrs. Burr, that's what I was going to ask you. I, Ted wasn't at school today. I, I thought he must be sick. No, he left for school this morning like he always does. I hope he's all right, Mrs. Burr. Uh, please let me know when you, when you find him. I will, Jean. Thanks for letting me know. A few moments later... Lynn, Mark, Jerry, and Martha arrive home for lunch. Helen questions them at the doorway as they enter. Helen to Lynn. Where's Teddy? I don't know. Who cares? Mark. I didn't see him, Mom. Maybe he stopped at the movie theater like he usually does. Jerry, did you see Teddy today? No. Martha is quiet. Martha, do you know where Teddy is? Uh, probably the movie theater. Yeah, I, I think I saw him walking toward the movie theater. Martha Elizabeth Burr, I know when you are lying to me. Oh, Ma, he made me promise not to tell. Young lady, you tell me where he is this very instant. He went to Cleveland. Cleveland? Why in the world... He took the 9.30 train. By himself? What on earth would possess him to do such a thing? He said he was going to the opera. Oh, my God. When your father hears about this, Helen takes a deep breath, exhales. Cut to the interior of a train car day. The train is pulling into the Cleveland station. Ted holds a newspaper clipping about a production of Wagner's The Ring as he looks out the window. Cut to the exterior of Cleveland's Terminal Tower. Ted is wide-eyed as he encounters the big city. Interior of Cleveland's Lyle and Haley's Music Store. Ted finds the vocal score of Wagner's Valkyrie and buys it. Cut to the interior of a restaurant in downtown Cleveland. While Ted eats his food, he studies the Valkyrie score. Cut to the interior of Cleveland Public Library. Ted reads a reference book on Wagner's The Ring Cycle. Cut to the exterior of Cleveland's Masonic Temple, the opera venue, in the evening. Ted is among the crowd entering the performance hall. Cut to the interior of the opera house, night. The performance is in progress. Kirsten Flogstadt, wearing a Viking helmet with horns and spear, sings an Isolde aria. Close up, Ted is entranced. Cut to the interior of Henry's study. Henry is smiling with his recognition and appreciation for Ted's love of opera. Cut to a memory of Henry's at the interior of the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City, night. The same production of Wagner's The Ring. The Bellamans sit in the dress circle watching the production. A scene with Lawrence Melchior singing a Tristan aria. Catherine is aglow. Henry's expression is one of indifference. We jump cut to the interior of the grand lobby of the of the uh, Metropolitan Opera. It's intermission time. The mezzanine is full of well-heeled patrons. The Bellamans meet with Estelle, the vocal coach, for a so social drink at intermission. Estelle, what did you think of Melchior's performance? Catherine, I think his voice has reached a new level of richness and, and clarity. Henry, he sings very well. His acting is merely serviceable. Estelle, really, Henry? Just serviceable? I admit, I do have a great difficulty separating the man from his craft. You don't live in the same building with him. 
I cringe every time I encounter him. I abhor his grotesque ego, which is even larger than his grotesque body, which he shamelessly flaunts with the inappropriate attire he wears while parading the hallways, and his personal grooming leaves much to be desired. Estelle. Well, now. Catherine says to Estelle, I experience his unusual presence, but I'm still able to appreciate his genius on stage. With a little jab at Henry, I've developed a greater capacity to hold character contradictions. Estelle and Catherine exchange a knowing chuckle. Henry politely grins at the inference. He notices a glamorous woman across the lobby. There's Argentina. I'm going to say hello to her. If you ladies will excuse me, he says to Catherine, I'll see you back at the seats. Estelle raises her eyebrows while Catherine purses her lips. We cut to the interior of the principal's office of Bellevue High School day. The principal. This is so unlike you, Ted. You've maintained perfect attendance until now. I'm sorry, Mrs. McDougall, but I felt justified in going to the opera since Miss Hargrove won't let me into the glee club. I have an extreme interest in music and singing and I consider opera a significant part of my musical education, which I am not getting here in the school. Why has Miss Hargrove not accepted you into the glee club? I don't know. Maybe you should ask Miss Hargrove. I know she lets football players participate in the glee club with much enthusiasm. The principal is caught off guard by Ted's assertion. That's enough, Ted. I think... You'll understand that I cannot excuse your absence. It will set a bad example for the other students, and so it will be reflected on your permanent record. I understand, Mrs. McDougall. I'll also understand that my future absences for attending opera will also not be excused. Well, now, that will be all, Ted. You may return to your class. Yes, Mrs. McDougall. Thank you. Cut to the exterior of the Burr home. It's on the porch at night. Floyd and Helen Burr sit on a swing on their front porch, cringing with what they are hearing from inside the house. Ted practices opera, singing Wagner's Brunhilde's war cry. Ho yo to ho, ho yo to ho, hiya ha, hiya ha. I do not sing as well as Ted in a soprano voice. And um, you get the picture, though. Uh, we cut to the interior of the Burr home living room. Ted finishes singing a vocal phrase as his father pokes his head through the door and into the living room. Can't you sing something like, I'll take you home again, Kathleen, or carry me home to old Virginie? Highly insulted, Ted grabs his music and stomps out. Cut to the exterior of the Burr home, the backyard, goat house. It's night. Ted stomps all the way out to the goat house. He flings open the door and puts his music on the grain barrel. The goat is eating her feed. Well, Minnie, once again you will be my audience. The goat's name is Minnie French, named after his deceased grandmother, Minnie French. He faces the open doorway to project his voice out into the entire neighborhood as he belts out Wagner's Townhauser Aria. A disgruntled Minnie bucks fiercely against the wooden structure. Ted, in the film, the 2000 docudrama at age 75, uh, recalls this story, and he says that um, during this scene, Minnie hated Wagner more than his father. <laughs> and we had a great laugh. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll end here for part three, and I'll look forward to uh, seeing you part four. If you have any questions, comments, or any perceptions you have about the story going along the way, please feel free to make the comments below, and we'll have a discussion. Uh, thanks so much for uh, joining. I was going to say attending <laughs> for... Uh, joining, and I'll see you next time. Take care.